All right, now we are on to pop art. This is also in our later Europe and America's content area, still in 20th century art. I wanted to begin this presentation with um, an actual interview with Andy Warhol, who was kind of the king of this pop art movement. And he's also an uh, artist in, um, in our book for one of our image organizers. Um, he was quite an interesting personality. Watching documentaries on him and pop art are extremely worth your while. He was a very interesting man with quite a past and quite a history. And again, this is one of those content areas where I will try my best to keep it concise, but there is actually so much to say about pop art. So we're gonna let Andy speak for himself. This is from 1964. This is just a snippet um, from an interview, um, but I'm gonna let him start it off. Andy, do you, do you hear, hear that? The public has told you that? I don't know. Why not? Uh, well, well, I haven't thought about, about it. It doesn't, it doesn't bother you at all, 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 Okay, so as you can see there, um, his personality was quite interesting. He was very cheeky, um, didn't say very much at all, um, and you probably didn't learn a darn thing about pop art from that interview. Um, but that was kind of the point. I wanted you to see a lot about what his personality was. If you watch documentaries on him, you'll be able to make sense of his personalities when learning about his childhood and his upbringing. Um, but he was um, extremely voyeuristic, um, quite an observer, um, very introverted, but most uh, importantly, he was a thinker and all the things that he observed, he would put into art. And for one person to be able to observe that well and then have creative output that literally changed society um, and changed art um, that we've known it since prehistory um, is quite impressive. So I'm going to give you um, some better definitions and characteristics of pop art to help you understand this movement. So pop art is a shortened term that came from the term popular. Um, so popular art is another way to phrase it. It's a movement that gathered momentum in the 50s and really reached its climax in the 60s. Um, but when I say reached its climax, I'm also not saying it died or fizzled out. As you can tell, these um, movements, they transform. You know, they kind of shift into something new. Um, they never just end. So that's important to understand. Um, they open a door is what they do. And then those doors remain open. Um, they may turn into something else and they may um, be a, a doorway that leads, you know, to another doorway, but um, it, it doesn't just kind of end and then, you know, you never see it again. Um, pop art is known for drawing on materials and subject matters of the everyday world, um, items of mass popular culture such as consumer goods and celebrities. That's your subject matter right there. Um, it is definitely a um, voice on consumerism in America. Um, you would think that it would um, immediately take kind of a negative connotation when you talk about consumerism in America. Um, in the past, we have um, confronted artworks that have a lot of commentary about that culture, that American culture of consumerism. And it usually does have kind of a negative connotation about, you know, materialism and, um, you know, mass production of goods. Um, but pop art's a little bit different, um, has a different approach on 
the consumerism. It's not necessarily a negative um, reaction to it. Um, it's not to say that there aren't some undertones about making people think about you know these products, um, but there really is a different motivation there, and we will definitely cover that. Um, so, what was amazing about Pop Art is that it really blurred some pretty definite boundaries um, between high art and graphic art. And I promised you that we would revisit this, and here we are. So um, this concept of graphic art, we talked about it in past content areas. Um, art Nouveau is kind of where we introduced it when we talked about um, the poster making of like Henry Toulouse uh, Lautrec. And um, we started to see some other type of posters that were designed um, for you know, Soviet propaganda and uh, in Dadaism and constructivism. Um, so we're starting to be introduced to this type of graphic art, um, but in the 50s and 60s, you know, it was still a very clear divide. Um, graphic art was almost like a, a trade or a business. You, you know, designed posters, you designed catalogs, um, you, um, designed um, even products um, for catalogs because products weren't always photographed. They were often drawn in the catalogs. Um, this graphic art was not seen as an art form at all. Um, it was a trade. It was a job. It was a business. And the people that produced these um, these graphic arts were not seen as artists at all. Um, art was considered high art, you know, it was items that belonged in a gallery or in a museum, and um, it was the collectors that made them famous. It was a very, very clear distinction. And Andy Warhol is 100% responsible for blurring those boundaries and bringing the graphic arts um, to the high art status. Um, that is really what this movement is about. Um, pop art also is known for glorifying and magnify the commonplace. Um, so what I like about this point is that um, it brings your viewer, your audience face to face with everyday reality, everyday objects, everyday products, um, everyday people that we all know. And what happens with that is now the commoner um, becomes closer to the artwork by making it familiar and comfortable. So let's think about this for a second. You know, you have this high art standard and you have this high art culture where um, these, you know, really philosophical artists who are being innovative and inventive produce artwork that is for a gallery or for an exhibition or for a museum. And there's a certain culture of people that participate in this and a certain culture of people that um, support it and support it financially by purchasing it, collecting it, or commissioning it. Now, think about um, your everyday common, lower middle class, you know, housewife um, participating in this culture. It didn't really happen. And it didn't happen necessarily because it's a status thing. It happened necessarily because it was more of an academia. So think about, you know, art during uh, Renaissance times or even Greek art. You know, artists were commissioned. Artists were extremely revered. Either the church commissioned them or royalty commissioned them because they were the best and they were well trained and they were extremely academic. And if you think about the Renaissance, those artists were almost like celebrities. They were sought out, they were even fought over. Um, there were feuds between them um, because they had this like celebrity status. And um, this whole like academia of art is not really for the commoner. 
But now Andy Warhol has changed that um, by making the subject matter about items and products and um, people we all know, it makes the commoner feel informed. It makes the average everyday person feel like they can look at a piece of artwork and connect with it. They can understand it. They have um, a history with it. And it didn't, you didn't have to be some sort of academically trained person to look at this art and understand it or even be able to critique it. You just had to recognize it and like it. And so what happened with that is um, artwork was becoming mainstream. It was becoming um, widespread and extremely popular. So hence the word pop art. Um, and it was an art for the masses. So this is a huge shift in um, the way art plays a role for society. Um, stylistically now, if we um, talk about pop art and its style, it's a reaction against abstract expressionism. So we're, we're moving away from that, you know, mark making, that kind of fierce brushwork, kind of going with your emotions type of um, construction of, of art, definitely moving away from that. It's becoming um, a completely different approach and, and style. Um, and the leaders of this movement, like I had said, was Andy Warhol. We'll probably talk about him the most. Um, Klaus Oldenburg, who is another artist um, in our book for our image organizers. Um, and then I added Roy Lichtenstein and James Rosenquist. And we're going to look at some of their artwork now. So I kind of have um, the artwork divided in these four corners. Up here you have James Rosenquist. This is um, a photograph of him. And these are some of his um, pop art paintings. So what he's known for is this thing called collage painting, where he would take um, popular imagery and almost overlap them and kind of collage them together, um, you know, in a, in a composition and then paint the whole thing. So when I say collage, please don't think he cut out pictures and adhered them to the canvas. Um, he would just use these images, draw them all together in a composition and then paint them. Um, so there was a lot of layering that occurred kind of some of that like see-through effect. Um, but his subject matters were items from um, popular culture. So here we have John F. Kennedy, you know, which is a, a recognizable figure of the time. Um, <clears throat> you have products. So this is like, you know, hair product. You have the um, US Air Force. You have images of the atomic bomb. Um, we have, you know, lipstick. Um, this is an upside down bag of groceries. I know that's hard to see. Um, so you have consumerism and you have um, products of the time and events of the time and then people of the time. So it's all about the moment. It's all about what is popular today. So if you would think about pop art right now for you and your generation, um, you know, it's definitely different. It it's not that these subject matters are always existing. The subject matters are always changing because popular culture is always changing. Over here on the right, this is Roy Lichtenstein and um, this is a picture of him and he was a, a painter, um, silkscreen artist. And what he is known for is that kind of uh, comic strip. Um, so using popular culture, and um, creating these paintings that have this real comic book stylization to it um, and creating these very flat fields of color just like a comic book style. Um, he did not work three-dimensionally very much at all, but I did go ahead and include. This is a three-dimensional um, art piece. It is of, you know, a table mirror, but this is his kind of iconic stylization here, um, creating the lines of the reflection in his color and his style. And 
a big part of why um, Roy Lichtenstein was so important to this movement was because of this graphic stylization. So remember, this is also the merging or the blurring of the boundaries between graphic art and fine art. And so his art is more of a display of how that occurred. Um, if you think of comic books, you know, they're mass produced, they're printed. Um, this is actually more of a graphic art type of business that didn't get revered at all as a high art or a fine art um, until, you know, this movement came about. Okay, down here in the left corner, we have um, images from Andy Warhol, um, some of his famous works, and boy, he studied pop art in every sense of the medium. So he experimented greatly with so many things. And I tried to give you a little variety here. Um, this is kind of one of his first paintings where um, it was got most of his notoriety um, displayed in a gallery. It was a painting, he actually painted that. But, you know, what are we looking at here? We're, we're looking at a product, um, a product that already pays, you know, millions of dollars in marketing and advertising. Um, but now we have this artist, you know, taking on this product and hanging it in the gallery. And, you know, it's almost kind of like a free advertisement. Um, and it was just really kind of a bizarre thing that um, was occurring at this time. He's also known here for his Campbell soup cans. Um, these were screen printed as well, a very large series. Each of them was kind of a different flavoring of the Campbell soup. Um, down here, he did play around with a little bit of sculpture. Um, these are his famous Brillo pads. Um, so he constructed these boxes and then silk screened the Brillo pad um, product um, onto the boxes. So it was a real actual product. I mean, it still is, but that was what the um, product design looked like at the time. Um, he's also known for his celebrity and famous people portraits that he would also silk screen. And we're going to talk more about his, his silk screening. Um, but he also was um, this wonderful genius at multimedia, which is a new concept also for the time. So multimedia meaning that he was a visual artist, but he would also, um, he also took an interest in music and film and photography. And he was known for kind of blending all of these mediums together to create these multimedia performances. Um, so what that means for us today is a lot of concerts that we go to see um, of celebrities where you're on stage and there's this light show and um, there's singing and there's there's dancing and there's, you know, like um, a big screen behind that has, you know, psychedelic lighting or film. Okay, so all of these things going on that stimulate the senses, um, that can all be thankful thanked by, um, to Andy Warhol for kind of creating this concept of this multimedia and performance. Um, he's the one that really started it. So um, what I'm pointing to here with the cursor, this is an album cover. So he also produced some music. Now he did not play music. He did not, he was not part of the band at all. He was part of the concept behind the band. And um, the band he's most known for is called the Velvet Underground. And um, Lou Reed was the um, singer of the Velvet Underground. And so um, he would produce their music and then he also designed their album covers. And then when the Velvet Underground would perform, Andy was in charge of kind of the setting up the, the event and the stage and the experience that the viewers had there. Um, instead of just coming to listen to the band play music, um, Andy took it three steps further and wanted to create an experience
for all of the senses, you know, an experience visually, an experience, um, you know, for the, for the ears, an experience um, for the body. So um, he kind of created these um, performance multimedia concepts. Um, and then over here to the left, he also was an avid filmmaker, but let me um, clarify that by saying experimental. So he's totally into experimental film. He worked with eight millimeter um, camera um, and he did lots of things from um, just kind of doing these uh, portrait stills of um, famous people, but also um, people that were kind of in his entourage, um, people that, you know, maybe were kind of like his pseudo friends, but were just kind of part of his, his life. Um, but then he would also create films of, um, which continued with the pop art theme, films of people doing everyday things. So like eating and sleeping. So one of his films is actually called Sleep. And it is, you know, like an eight hour film um, where he's just filming somebody sleeping the whole entire time. Um, so they were very avant-garde, very artsy, um, very experimental. Um, and so he's known for taking pop art into many, many realms. One thing I did not include in this area is that he was also um, a businessman, you know, bottom line. And in the 1980s, he did um, create a magazine called Interview Magazine, which is still in print today, um, and opened up that business. And Interview Magazine is uh, absolutely beautiful magazine to look at. It is larger in size and it has very gorgeous um, photos and kind of, you know, um, high quality um, artistic photos and, and um, material. But Interview Magazine really is a magazine about that, that features like a celebrity um, and does really candid and, and lengthy interviews with them. Um, amongst other things, but that's kind of the premise of the magazine. Um, and then over here to the right, we have Klaus Oldenburg, who we will be looking at. So Klaus Oldenburg is our 3D pop art guy, and um, really that's kind of all he has done. Uh, I mean, he draws in sketches, but um, primarily he works three-dimensionally. But he doesn't just create sculpture. Um, he's also known for creating these colossal public sculptures. I mean, they're just absolutely humongous. Um, and he's worked with many different styles of materials that he's, kn he's known for many different approaches to sculpture. But the one consistent thing is his subject matter. His subject matter has always been about an everyday object, or um, he's also known for juxtaposition. So we talked about juxtaposition in the past, where you're putting two objects together that, that don't typically belong together. And um, he would do that with his sculptures, but he would also do that with his environment. Um, so oftentimes he would, you know, create a colossal sculpture of an everyday random object, but then where he placed it um, in the public environmentally is how you would get the juxtaposition. Okay, so this is our first image organizer, the Maryland Diptych, and um, this is by Andy Warhol. And uh, before I kind of give you the breakdown of content and medium and all of that, I have a very short video here, two minute video about um, some great information on this um, Andy Warhol subject matter. Um, that will give you some strong context to this image. As a golden legend of Hollywood, Marilyn Monroe fascinated Andy Warhol. For Warhol, movie stars had become glittering idols, replacing, in a way, the religious icons of his childhood. One of the most famous stars in Hollywood history is dead at 36. 
Maryland's Maryland suicide, suicide on August, August 5th, 1962, 1962 struck, struck a personal, personal chord for the artist. Fall, leave behind, behind the glittering, glittering, glittering tragic legend, final, final fatal. Press, Press accounts, accounts of the tragedy, tragedy appeared the next, the next morning, Warhol's 34th birthday. Her life seemed like a fairy tale, but behind the glamour was Norma Jean, a product of foster homes and local marriages. Monroe's death, death triggered a series of paintings for the artist, artist in the month that followed, in, in which he isolated her visage against an electrifying palette of candy, candy colors. colors. World painted painted the Maryland Maryland just before his famous death, death disaster, disaster series. series. I, realized I realized that everything, everything I was doing must have been, must have been death. death, he would say a year later. later. The, the film like repetition of Monroe's face in the screen printed image is reminiscent of the life she lived. The camera never betrayed her pain. The image was sourced from the Central Niagara publicity still taken nine, nine years prior at the actress's peak. Yet for all the happy business bubbling the media and brought into the lives of millions, she was seldom able to find it lastingly for herself. It's a big deal, and I'm very appreciative to everyone who's made this possible. With his finger on the pulse of culture, Warhol captured not only the true essence of celebrity, but also the zeitgeist of the 1960s. Immortalizing Monroe as an emblem of the 20th century. Okay, that was a really great introduction to this piece of artwork. So now we're going to break it down a little bit further. So this is image 147 in our book. It is called Marilyn Diptych. Diptych, if you were not aware, means two panels. So um, you will commonly hear the term diptych and triptych. Um, one just means two and the other one means three. Like I said, it's by Andy Warhol from 1962. It's oil, oil acrylic, and silk screen enamel on canvas. Uh, silk screen, screen enamel really is just a silk screen ink that they use. Okay, uh, let's talk about content here. So the portrait, of an iconic celebrity, Marilyn Monroe. It's been repeated 50 times in rows and columns, so in a grid format. The backgrounds um, are rectangularly shaped. The image comes from her movie, um, Niagara. The first half, the first um, panel is in color um, with hyper-realistic coloring. And then the second half is just in black and white. All right, getting into context, breaking it down. So the artwork, um, like we learned, was an immediate reaction to the death of Marilyn Monroe. He completed um, this art piece specifically four months after her death. He did produce a ton of different Marilyn Monroe um, paintings and silk screens. Um, we're just focusing on this one, but I do have images of others. Um, he repeated the images um, which can be symbolic of the mass production. So, you know, pop art really glorifies um, consumerism. And when you think about consumerism, you think about mass production. And so um, what happens when things are mass produced? Well, what happens is it kind of drains the meaning out of things. Um, so that is kind of the irony here or the point of this piece is that um, the mass production of her portrait again and again and again, it drains the meaning of Marilyn and her iconic image or the photo of her. Um, the reproduction of her portrait many, many times, it denies the concept of uh, a unique piece of art. So conceptually, if you think about that, you know, doing an art piece to pay homage to somebody who just passed, if you did one art piece that paid homage to her, it would feel very kind of unique. Um, but when you're mass producing it again and again and again, um, you kind of have that industrial type of feeling, factory feeling, um, which doesn't make the piece or the person very unique anymore. And that's kind of part of the commentary here. Part of that whole like Hollywood, um, you know, mentality of this pain and suffering that celebrities go through when um, 
they are put in the public eye and you know how many um, celebrity lives are, are lost at a very, very young age um, because of that. And so this is, a, this is a commentary on that for sure. On the left-hand side um, in color, we have um, this panel representing her life. And then on the right-hand side in the black and white, that panel is representing her death. So um, two panels, a diptych, one representing life and the other representing death. Continuing on, um, Marilyn's public face, um, it appears highlighted by bold but extremely artificial colors. And a lot of times the way that the um, color is layered on um, her silk screen face, it really looks like a mask. So this image I have over here, um, a couple a couple things I have here. Number one, I gave you um, kind of a ratio to see how large the art piece was. So if you took you know the viewer's head and compared it to the head uh, one of the heads of Marilyn, it's close to life size. Um, Marilyn's a little bigger, but it's close to life size. Um, and then here, what I have is this image is the actual photograph that Andy Warhol used. And what happens in the silk screen process is um, he would first silk screen the black. Um, so you would get this image actually first. And then what he did is created other um, screens that would allow the shape of color to come off um, over the black. So he would have a screen of this you know, bright yellow wig. He would have a screen of this blue shape for the um, eye makeup, uh, a, sh a screen just for the red lips, etc. And so that would all get layered on here. And with that layering process then, um, close up, it really kind of looks like this colored mask is on her face. And um, again, that was purposeful, that was truly intentional. Um, what that represents is the private persona of the individual um, is submerged beneath this public facade of a face. So again, the struggles that celebrities go through living um, a public life. Um, her social char characteristics that you know she was known for are extremely magnified. Um, so like the brilliant blonde hair, um, the lipstick that is very red and heavily applied, her seductive expression, and this bold eye makeup. Um, the black and white reproductions, um, if you notice, they, be, they begin to fade. So from left to right, they begin to fade. And so on a technical explanation, what happens is when you um, do your first screen print, it's usually very, very saturated. And when you do screen printing, you are supposed to number your prints. Um, and the actual first print that you do is, is not supposed to be numbered. That's called an artist proof because the first print is always very heavy and, and it bleeds a lot of ink and, and it, it doesn't always look very good. Um, but as you continue, right, and continue to, um, you know, make the next print, make the next print, make the next print, um, the print gets lighter and lighter if you're not adding more ink to it. Um, so this, again, was intentional and purposeful. It serves a message and symbolism. Since the right side represents her death, um, it symbolizes the death of an icon and the analogy of her fading away. The medium, like I said, is silkscreen and silkscreen ink onto canvas. We will um, get to watch a little one-minute video on how Andy um, would accomplish a lot of his silk screens. Um, the motivation and the purpose for this art piece um, is artistic expression and to pay homage to the celebrity that was um, pretty important to Andy Warhol. Okay, so the innovation here um, is the silk screening process um, that was for high art. So here we go again talking about graphic arts and it's not always just about the style or um, the subject matter, 
but now we're talking about a process, a process here that um, only occurred in factories. And now we have this process in the hands of an artist that is making high art. So that is also a, another huge blurring of um, the, the boundaries. And so this silkscreen process prior to Andy Warhol, it, it did not exist in the high art world at all. Um, like I said, it was meant for businesses and factories and mass production of items. It was a trade, it was not an art form. So that's a very huge innovation. Um, another innovation for this particular piece is, um, you know, making celebrities as important as royalty and also the mass production of high art. Um, for form, we're looking at, um, there's repetition here, obviously. Um, the repetition um, creates a pattern. We have extremely bold colors. We have a uh, symmetrical balance between the diptych and the two panels. Um, we have smudging and fading of colors, lines, and shapes. And um, on his diptych, um, we have somewhat complementary colors, variations of blues and, and variations of red oranges. The theme for this could be that it's a portrait. Um, and in the comparison, I compared it to the um, Totilco figures um, because these were figures that um, represented people, people in their tribe um, and most commonly women. Um, and they were originally extremely brightly painted. Now it's hard to find one that's brightly painted just because they are relics and they have been worn. Um, but if you were to recreate one um, according to how they originally looked, they were very, very brightly colored um, as well. And they're also known for their um, stylization of their facial expressions. And so I thought that was a good comparison. Okay, so we have a second image organizer for our pop art movement. And um, this is sculptural now. So this one is called Lipstick Ascending on Caterpillar Tracks. And it's by Klaus Oldenburg from 1969 to 1974. And we're gonna talk about those two um, dates here in a second. It's Corten steel, aluminum, um, and cast resin painted with enamel. So enamel, by the way, is a paint that is specifically designed to adhere to metal and um, can also withstand um, certain weathering. Okay, so content, what we have here, what we're looking at is a red colored lipstick in a gold container that is sitting on top of a tank base. And um, the whole thing is 24 feet tall. For form, well, we have that juxtaposition here of two unusual objects. They are coming together to create one sculpture. Size and proportion is extraordinary so um, and inaccurate to reality. So what we have here, first of all, size is you know ex extremely larger than what it would be in real life, but also proportion. So you know here we have a lipstick that's looking bigger and grander than you know part of an army tank which we know is not a realistic ratio um, we have a bright shiny red orange focal point against a matte black um, tank and it gives color contrast and um, it's also a contrast of surface um, matte versus shiny it's a very tall vertical sculpture sculpture and it is simple um, you're just given enough information to understand the objects and and that's it um, the motivation for this art piece is actually political activism and we will um, be discussing that in context um, and then the convention or the theme um, is that it is a public sculpture Okay, so now we're going to get into the context here. And so this is going to um, help us understand these two dates that we have here. So I put in some images of 1969, the, um, the, when the original sculpture was created. Um, so two of these sculptures were made. The original was in 1969 at um, Beinecke um, Plaza at Yale University 
Um, so the original piece was secretly erected um, in this plaza area, and it was meant to be a platform for speaking at an anti-Vietnam War rally. So Klaus Oldenburg and you know a huge group of people were um, part of this um, anti-war um, group, and they were planning a rally in this university plaza. And so um, Klaus's contribution to this was to create this kind of visual sculptural platform um, to help kind of um, express, you know, what the rally was all about. The original um, was made only of plywood. Um, so the tank was made of plywood. And then the lipstick was actually an, like an inflatable vinyl balloon. So in this photograph, you can kind of see the lipstick is starting to be blown up. Um, so it was a soft material. Um, and like I said before, the sculpture was designed just to serve as a stage for this rally, but then actually um, stayed at the plaza and continued to perform the same role for um, a few protests thereafter. But remember, these materials, they were perishable and they didn't weather very well, so they didn't last very long at all. So I want to get into the context a little bit further about how this was an anti-war symbol um, and kind of talk about the juxtaposition of these two objects. Um, so what the symbolism is, is that you have um, kind of these male and females, these representatives of male and female uniting. So the lipstick representing the female and the male um, from the army tank. Um, it replaces the upper portion of the tank with a uh, lipstick. And so what that is symbolic of is this lipstick is this kind of harmless object that is creating the upper portion of the tank where usually you have um, the driver and the actual gun of the tank. Um, so we've replaced that with something um, that is not harmful at all. So we also have um, a meshing of hyper-masculine military imagery um, with consumerism of America. So it does have um, a bit of a um, consumerist um, message about just American culture in general, and um, which was also kind of an important um, concern with the Vietnam War was that, you know, we had economic interest and that was part of our involvement. Purposely, the lipstick also um, was very large and phallic looking, um, but it also resembled closely to a bullet. Um, and then what that did is it turned this benign uh, product of beauty into something very violent. So what I like about this piece is you can kind of stand from multiple perspectives um, and kind of see something different in it, but walk away still with the same kind of, of message. Um, so it, in one aspect, we can see the lipstick as a harmless beauty product that's replacing the you know, harmful part of the tank. But then from another perspective, we can also see the lipstick that actually resembles um, a bullet and turns this you know, everyday beauty product into something violent. Um, more symbolism also, um, it combines the domestic and the military, which was very important um, when thinking about the Vietnam War socially um, because uh, this was one of the wars where everybody was involved in this war. Um, it was um, highly politicized and socialized. It was um, a war that kind of wasn't just happening overseas somewhere, but it was also happening um, at home culturally with the people that um, protested it or people that you know were trying to support our troops. Um, and our involvement in it, it, it really was kind of a, a social mess at this time. Um, one of Oldenburg's quotes, which I thought was quite interesting in 1961, his declaration was that, I am for an art 
that is political, erotical, mystical, that does something other than sit on its ass in a museum. I am for an art that imitates the human, that is comic, if necessary, or violent, or whatever is necessary. Um, so it, it just kind of shows that his political activism um, was a huge motivation in many of his art pieces, um, especially this one. So this is where 1974 comes into play. Um, later on, it was refurbished as a permanent sculpture um, and was erected permanently in front of Morse College at Yale University um, when it was um, permanently um, constructed. Then it was made out of steel and aluminum and cast resin. Um, and it is technically Oldenburg's very first colossal sculpture. Um, so this was, at the time, his largest erected sculpture, um, but only was the start to many, many more to come um, internationally. When I did some comparisons, um, I was able to find quite a few comparisons for me. The first um, was a column of Trajan, uh, simply for form, you know, just this being this tall cylindrical column that I think really looked a lot like the lipstick. Um, I also put the um, Bamiyan Buddha in there for um, the ver uh, verticality of um, the sculpture, but also that colossal. Uh, we, we really learned about the term colossal when we looked at all of our colossal Buddhas. Um, and so it kind of has that same impact in terms of size. Um, but then in regards to motivation, I put our const constructivism uh, image titled The Results of the First Five-Year Plan um, to kind of compare it to political propaganda and expression. So in summary, pop art subject matter um, was of recognizable everyday objects, icons, and people. Um, pop art is known for merging graphic reproducible, reproducible art with high art. Um, it was art that was finally meant for the masses, not just the, um, the academic or the bougie or the um, kind of art culture. Um, and it also involved new techniques such as silk screening, collage painting, and multimedia art forms. Um, I really do want to just clarify silk screening for you. It, um, you, you may know what it is. It, it's honestly how a lot of your printed t-shirts are made. So it is a process that is still widely used today. Um, but it is a printmaking technique where you have this mesh cloth, which is made out of silk. It's like a woven silk stretched over a heavy wooden frame. And then the image or design is affixed to this silk um, by stencil, um, leaving you know open areas and masked off areas. And then what you do is you force ink through this screen with a squeegee um, and it pours through those open areas and then prints on you know, paper or t-shirt or canvas. And so here I, I kind of have like a one minute video of Andy Warhol and his assistant working on some silk screening. And um, this was right after his Marilyn Monroe series. Um, he started this um, series called Death and Dying. And um, it was the Marilyn Monroe diptych that actually prompted this, this series to follow. Um, but as he's working, he's also kind of, um, I think he was also kind of giving an interview. But what I, what I like about this is you get to see kind of the sizing um, that he's working with and the squeegee effect. And the sizing was so large that, you know, he worked on the floor. With his art work in demand as never before, Warhol resolved to step up production. In January 1963, he moved his studio from the parlor of his townhouse, no longer large enough to accommodate his larger paintings, to the third floor of an abandoned red brick firehouse a few blocks away on East 87th Street. In June, to increase production still further, 
He took on a new assistant, a 20-year-old college student from the Bronx named Gerard Malanga, who had learned how to silk screen a few years before while working for a necktie manufacturer. The more you look at Warhol's work, the more you look at Warhol, the more you see a mind constantly engaged in the studio. We see him making a series of decisions in the studio, how one painting leads to another painting, how one series leads to another painting. There are a series of insights, and you get a sort of logic almost that unfolds in the studio that's of an intensely committed and engaged Sophisticated okay, and so that sums up our um, discussion on pop art for this later Europe and America's content.